The story is told of a small village in the Swiss Alps, nestled between a couple of those mighty mountains, inhabited by mountain climbers and mountain guides. And in that small village, there's a small cemetery. Some prestigious-looking stones, but one very simple stone that says on it, he died climbing. The best uh, statement that could be made about a town full of climbers and guides. He died climbing, which could well be Joshua's testimony too, as he comes toward the end of his life. Joshua chapter 23 is the text this morning. If you turn in your Bibles or on your electronic devices, when we come to these verses, we find that Joshua is reaching the age of somewhere between 105 and 110. The years of conquest have been long over, and he gathers Israel together, and we read these words. A long time afterward, when the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their surrounding enemies, and Joshua was old and well advanced in years, Joshua summoned all Israel, its elders and heads, its judges and officers, And said to them, I am now old and well advanced in years. Joshua has lived through the transition from Moses to him. He's lived through the transition from the years of wandering in the wilderness to years of warring in the land. And now he knows there's another transition coming, a transition from his leadership to he doesn't know whose leadership coming after him. And as he looks out across the landscape, he is concerned about what the future holds. And he wants the people of Israel to move ahead in a purposeful pursuit. As I was planning the preaching schedule earlier, actually last year, I chose this book of Joshua knowing that a transition would be coming for Berean, not knowing when it would be, and we still don't know for sure, But knowing that this book has a lot to say to us about how to walk and follow God into the future with purpose. And so, please again, don't start saying goodbye. We're a long way away from that. But I do want to think about what does it look like as we move ahead toward the future that God has for us. In chapters 23 and 24, Joshua addresses, first in chapter 3, mostly the leaders And then in chapter 4, I think, or 24, I think it is the leaders as well as most of the nation, at least as many as could gather, as he gives to them some farewell words that sound a lot like some of the words that Moses gave in the book of Deuteronomy, but Joshua just gets two chapters to do it. This morning in chapter 23, Joshua gives us three critical words for purposeful pursuit into the future that God has for us. The first word is that God has been and will be faithful. We can reflect back on how God has blessed us, knowing that he's the same God today and will be the same God tomorrow. And so if you reflect back on God's blessings to us as a body of believers... For over 50 years, God has blessed. He has given us a faithful core of people here. He has given us unity that we shouldn't take for granted. In the last 50 plus years, many churches have split. Many churches have died. And God in his sovereign grace has allowed us to be united and connected. God has given us serving people who work often behind the scenes. Many of them are in heaven today, but many of them are also ministering throughout our campus this morning or were earlier in children's ministry and nursery and sound tech and in the control room and as greeters and a host of other ways. God has given us a loving people. One of the things that as we have talked to the potential candidate he has heard from a number, including the search committee the other night, is that most of the time, at least, the people of Berean love each other. Now, we sometimes rub each other the wrong way, but we really do like being together. He's blessed us with great facilities. 
potentially an addition to the facilities. He's blessed us, blessed us financially. He's blessed us with growth, both growth in depth and growth in breadth. He's blessed us with being able to do a number of years ago a church plant that is going well at Recast Church in Matawan. And so many other ways God has blessed Berean. And we can look back and say, God's been faithful. And he will continue to be faithful. And so the first thing that Joshua challenges them and us is to remember what God has done for us. For Israel, he couches it in terms of warfare. The Lord has fought for you. And you have seen with your own eyes all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake, for you. For it is the Lord your God who has fought for you. You are eyewitnesses, he says, to the power of God. You saw the walls of Jericho fall. You saw the sun stand still at Ai. You've seen Israel's armies defeat much larger armies time and again because God fought for you, not because Joshua was such a great general. The nations were defeated because of God. And Joshua wants them to understand leaders change, God doesn't. And I would say the same to you, that God's blessings on Berean are not because of Pastor Clark or Pastor Davis or Pastor Mike or me. They're because God is faithful and God blesses his people. But I want you also to reflect back individually. What has God done for you personally, individually? And remember that God is faithful, and because he is faithful in the past, he will be faithful in the future. God sent Jesus. He sent Jesus to die on the cross to pay for your sins and my sins. That's the greatest thing he could have done for us. He offers us salvation through Christ. He offers us rescue from hell And he's blessed us in so many other ways individually. If you reflect on those for just a moment, it should encourage you, it should encourage me that just as he's been faithful, he will continue to be faithful. Joshua also tells us, closely connected to that, to remember what God has given us. For Israel, it's a land. And though it may sound in verse 4 like Joshua is taking the credit, From the rest of the chapter, we know several times he says, God is given, God is given. I just divided it. Behold, I have allotted to you as an inheritance for your tribes those nations that remain, along with all the nations that I already cut off from the Jordan to the great sea in the west. God has given you this great inheritance. And by God's grace, Joshua has divided that land. God has given you and me, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, peace with him, a right relationship with him. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, he has clothed you in the righteousness of Christ so that you and I stand before God, not in our filthy, sinful rags, but in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He sees us as holy because of his grace. He's given us eternal life right now. It's not just heaven, it's right now we have the abundant life of fellowship with God. And we have eternity with God ahead for us. He has given us each other, that loving family that we've talked about, people to encourage us. And he's given us so many more things. So remember what God has given. Paul says, if if God didn't spare his own son for us, why in the world do we think he won't? generously give us everything else that we need for life and godliness. God has given. But not only that, Joshua says, remember what God has promised us. Verse 5, the Lord your God will push them back before you and drive them out of your sight and you shall possess the land just as the Lord your God has promised. Promise is a key word. It appears not only here, but in verse 10, verse 14, and verse 15. 
So though he is going to be passing off the scene, he knows there's still land to be occupied. There's still mopping up action, warfare to be done. And he says, God is faithful. He will keep his promises to you. So keep moving ahead for him. So that first critical word that he shares with those leaders is that God has been and will be faithful. We can trust him. We can remember what he's done. And so remember, go to the cross and remember what God has done for us. Pastor and evangelist Dwight Moody was preaching one day on Psalm 103 to his people. And he reached the point of the verse that says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And he stopped and he looked out and he said, You can't remember them all, of course, but don't forget them either. And I'd say the same to you. You and I can't begin to remember all that God has given to us and done for us and promised us. But don't forget them either. Cling to them and allow them to encourage us for the future. So while we don't live in the past, We can allow the past to encourage us and to motivate us for the present. God has been and will be faithful, so we must remain faithful to Him. As we look at what He has done for us, it should push us toward being faithful because He has been faithful to us. And so verse 6 begins with the word, therefore. And I've told you before, and it's not original to me, when you see the word therefore, ask what it's there for. This therefore is pointing back to the verses we just looked at. And it's saying because of what God has done in giving us victory and giving us the land and what he's promised us, because of those things, therefore be very strong to keep And to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, turning aside from it neither to the right hand nor to the left. Because of what God has done, obey the word of God. Be very strong to keep. That word keep is the same word we looked at last week, shamar, guard. Be faithful, be persistent to guard obedience. And to do everything, not selective obedience, but everything God has said. And if you see those words on the screen or heard them as I read them, they they might sound a little familiar because they're very similar, almost word for word, what God said to Joshua back in chapter 1, verse 7, when he said, be strong and courageous, keep the law, don't let it depart out of your mouth, obey it, don't turn to the right or to the left. But now... Joshua is the leader passing off the scene. In chapter 1, it was Moses. But now Joshua is, and so he is taking those words that maybe if they had life verses in the Old Testament, maybe this was his life first. And he's saying to the next generation, hang on to obedience to God. Hang on to what God has said. Don't go off to the right. Don't go off to the left. Don't turn away. But instead... Follow God's path. In southern Ohio, there is a a, a a geological area called Old Man's Cave. Some of you I know have been there. There there really isn't much of a cave. There's one or two there, but there are a lot of rock formations. It's, It's a beautiful, fun place to go. But throughout Old Man's Cave are these signs. Danger, stay on designated trails. Because every year, somebody goes off the trail and falls and injures themselves or gets killed or has to be rescued because they didn't stay on the path. Joshua's hanging a sign for Israel and saying, stay on the designated trail. Stay on God's path. Follow and obey. He also warns them, resist the impact of a pagan culture. Twenty-some years have passed since the conquest drew to a close, and yet Israel hasn't completed the conquest. Perhaps Joshua looks around and he sees some apathy creeping in. 
He is rightly concerned that the people of Israel will now begin to intermingle with the Canaanites. In fact, the word nations occurs seven times in this chapter. He is concerned about that mixing. And it's not because he's a racist. He's not saying drive out the Canaanites because there was something about their race. It's because of their religious practice, because of their immorality, because of the the pagan way that they worshiped their false gods. He's concerned that Israel will mingle and mix with them. And so he urges them to resist the impact of a pagan culture. You see, Canaanite culture in that day was very advanced much more technologically advanced than Israel's culture. And Israel was coming as a nation of wanderers into this land, and they're going to have to learn how to be farmers. And so where are they going to look to learn farming? To their Canaanite neighbors, perhaps. And it might not be bad to learn a few farming skills, but Canaanite culture was completely wrapped up in idolatry. And so farming wasn't just plowing, it was also intermingled with the worship of their false gods. And Joshua says, you're going to be tempted to be sucked in by that Canaanite culture. Don't. Look at verse 7 in his warning. That you may not mix with these nations remaining among you or make mention of the names of their gods or swear by them or serve them or bow down to them, but you shall cling to the Lord your God just as you have done to this day. He says, don't pretend they're real. When you're entering into a business dealing, don't say, well, you know, I'll go along. In the name of Baal, I promise I'll do this. Don't do it. He says, don't bow down to them in prayer. Don't serve them. Don't ally yourself with them. Instead, cling. Be glued to. It's the same word that's used in Genesis 2 of the relationship between husband and wife cleaving, being glued together. Cling to the Lord your God in an exclusive relationship. Cling to Him with a non-compete clause. In fact, later in the chapter, Joshua will use a word that doesn't get used a lot in his book. Cling to him in covenant relationship. And don't allow your heart to be turned away by Canaanites. See, the Canaanites would say something like this. Well, you know, you're in a drought. By the way, you can thank me for bringing the rain because I watered my lawn last night, washed the cars the other day, so I'll take credit for that. Well, the Canaanites wouldn't say wash the cars, or what they would say is, it is you're in a drought. Baal is angry. You must appease Baal by engaging in these immoral acts and by crying out to him. And a Israelite might say, well, you know, they've been here a lot longer than us. They know the land better than us. I guess I'll do that. And they get sucked in. Joshua says, cleave to Jehovah your God. Our culture calls on us to compromise, doesn't it? Compromise our sexual ethics. To compromise in terms of gender identity and what God has to say about that to compromise about how we respond to people, whether we, we respond with the outrage and the anger of our age or with grace and kindness. Our culture tries to press us into its mold, and Joshua says, resist it. Resist the impact of a pagan culture. And as you do that, remember where victory lies. Remember how you win battles. It's not by compromising with the culture. It's not by your own strength. It's by God. Verse 9, for the Lord has driven out before you great and strong nations. The Lord has driven out. And as for you, no man has been able to stand before you to this day. One man of you puts to flight a thousand since it is the Lord your God who fights for you just as he promised. One of you is worth a thousand of the enemy. And so a few years down the road, Gideon will take 300 men against that enormous army of the Midianites and win. Why? Because God fights for them. Be very careful, therefore, he says, to love the Lord your God. Be very careful. Guard, same word, shamar. Guard your love for God. 
dramatically, if you were to diagram out this, this passage, this chapter, verse 11 is the center. Love the Lord your God. Which is what Moses said in Deuteronomy, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so he wants them to remember that victory comes when our love for God is what it ought to be, not when we give in to the culture. And he warns them that deliberately turning back, the same thing we looked at last week, deliberately turning away from God will bring defeat. And just a few pages over in your Bible, in the book of Judges, that's exactly what happens. And so Joshua says in verse 12, For if you turn back and cling to the remnant of these nations, by the way, cling, be glued to, you violate your exclusive contract with God and you cling to false gods, if you cling to the remnant of these nations remaining among you and make marriages with them so that you associate with them and they with you, know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations before you but they shall be a snare and a trap for you, a whip on your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from off this good ground that the Lord your God has given you. He said, if you intermingle with the Canaanites, if you don't cling to God and instead allow your contract with God to be intermingled with the Canaanites, then God will allow them to bring pain into your life. There'll be a trap. There'll be a snare. There'll be a whip that hurts you. There'll be a thorn in your eyes. Now, I've never had a thorn in my eyes, thankfully. But I have had dust or an eyelash under my contact lens, and that's painful enough. He's saying, you will be harmed by that connection with the Canaanites, and ultimately God will drive you out of the land that he has given to you. Because God has promised them things, but that promise calls for obedience. God is faithful. And so we must remain faithful to him. Joshua is telling them, direction for life is not going to be found in the Canaanites' religion. And he would say to us, direction in life is not going to be found in the culture around us, but only in the word of God. The danger for us is not that we will be overwhelmed by our culture. The danger is that we will surrender to our culture. Many in what was called the emergent church movement, now is called progressive Christianity, they have surrendered the truth for cultural acceptance. And Joshua and God's word is saying, don't do that. We are called to live among and interact with those who don't know Jesus, but not to imitate them. Instead, we're to obey the word and resist the culture and remember that it is a relationship with God that brings victory. There's a third critical word here for our purposeful pursuit. We have to remain faithful because God's faithfulness includes discipline for our unfaithfulness. Joshua has already warned in verse 13, but now those warnings amp up. They reach a climax in the verses that come at the end of the chapter as he warns them, don't turn away from God because if you do, God will lovingly and graciously and faithfully discipline. But he starts out by reminding them what he's already said. God's promises are certain. God blesses obedience. He keeps his word to those who cling to him. Verse 14. And now I'm about to go the way of all the earth. He says, my death is approaching. And you know in your hearts and souls, you know this truth. All of you know it. That not one word has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one of them has failed. And the word failed is an interesting word. It literally means to drop something. God has never dropped a promise. God has never dropped his people. He doesn't fail. His promises are certain. But 
God's judgment is just as certain if we don't cling to him. We're a lot like our children, and Joshua knows it. Sometimes an exhortation to obedience isn't enough. We need a warning of consequences if we don't obey. And so that's what Joshua does. He says God is faithful, but his faithfulness includes his love and grace that disciplines us when we don't follow the right path for our good. But just as all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you have been fulfilled for you, so the Lord will bring upon you all the evil things until he has destroyed you from off this good land that the Lord your God has given you. If you transgress the covenant of the Lord your God which he commanded you and go and serve other gods and bow down to them, then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you and you shall perish quickly from off the good land that he has given you. And in 586, that was completely fulfilled as Israel is swept out of the land by the Babylonians because God's faithful and he disciplines faithfully to turn us back to the right path. God is faithful and his faithfulness includes discipline when we aren't. The author of Hebrews, picking up on Proverbs, says this, And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves. See, it's not out of anger. It's not out of spite. It's out of love. And chastises every son whom he receives. Lovingly, graciously, God calls us back even through discipline. So are you wandering away from the Lord this morning? Are you drawing close to the culture? Are you clinging to something or someone other than God? Are you losing your love for him? Then turn. Turn around and repent and come back before discipline has to come. Someone has said the greatest danger in your life is not that you will lose your job or your health or even your friends and family, but that you might lose your faith. And so God disciplines us to turn us back to him. And and I've been talking mostly this morning to those who are followers of Jesus Christ, but it may be that in this worship center or watching online, there's someone who isn't. And so I just want you to know that that God who is faithful loves you so much that he gave his son Jesus, like we talked about earlier, to die for your sins. So that by confessing your sins and and giving your life to him, you can have forgiveness and a right relationship with God. But the alternative is judgment if you don't do that. The good news is there's still time to turn from the path of judgment in faith and repentance, and ask Christ to save you. And you can do that right where you're seated this morning, or I would be glad to talk to you, Pastor Steve would be glad to talk to you, Pastor Ryan would, before you leave this morning, so that you can know that your relationship with Jesus Christ is right, and through him, your relationship with God the Father. Joshua wants us to understand that God is faithful to keep his promises, even the promise to punish those who don't obey, those who don't turn to him. Three critical words for our purposeful pursuit. That God has been and always will be faithful to us, and so that faithfulness to us calls for faithfulness toward him. And if we don't exercise that faithful obedience, we don't cling to him then he will faithfully call us back through loving discipline. So are you continuing purposeful pursuit of God? Are you obeying God? Are you clinging to God? Or this morning, do you need to bow the knee and repent, come back to him? It was really, really quiet in the other room, and little Johnny's parents knew quiet probably wasn't a good thing. So they went into the other room to investigate, and they found Johnny with his hands stuck 
in a really expensive old vase. In fact, so expensive, we ought to call it probably a vase, right? And so they soaped his hand, and they tried to get it out, and it wouldn't come out. And they tried cooking oil, and they tried everything they could find online by Googling it to get his hand out, and it could not get out of the vase. And so they decided this was calling for drastic action. They were going to have to break this really expensive vase and try to do it in a way that he wouldn't be hurt. And little Johnny was afraid of it. And so looking up at his parents with tear-filled eyes, he said, Would it help if I let go of the penny I'm holding? Yeah, probably. So I ask you this morning, what are you clinging to? Whom are you clinging to? Is it anything other than God and obedience to him? Then let go of it before God has to smash the vase, before he has to discipline Because this chapter is telling us that living for God is not a single battle, but lifelong faithfulness to our faithful God. Let's pray. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, do you need to repent? Do you need to let go of something? Run to God right now. Ask him for forgiveness. If you don't know God, if you've never trusted Christ, then right there where you're seated, you can just tell him you're sorry for your sins, that you know that Jesus died for you and that you want Jesus' death, his payment, to pay for the sins that you've committed against God. Father, all of us, like the hymn writer says, are prone to wander. Lord, we feel it. Prone to leave the God that we love. But help us to guard our love for you. Help us to cling to you. Help us to remember who you are and what you have done for us. And to love and obey you as a response. Thank you for these ancient words of challenge from the lips of a man that we'll see in heaven someday, Joshua. In Jesus' name we pray.